All right, everyone, welcome back to the last presentation for today of the Midwest Mountaineering Outdoor Adventure Expo. Uh, with me virtually, I have Highwell Taff Roberts. Uh, he's the director of Wild Whales Tours and Walkabouts. Uh, great storyteller, adventure, uh, sailor, film director, naturalist, avid hiker. Um, this is a presentation on the hiking history and culture in Wales. So without further ado, oh, I should mention, um, uh, over at the OutdoorAdventureExpo.com site, below the video player, there's a click to join chat box. We'll be taking questions at the end, so feel free to uh, answer any, ask any questions there, and I'll be sure to get them over to, to Taff here uh, after the presentation is over, and we'll get them answered for you, okay? So without further ado, here we are. Well, I'd like to thank um, Rod Johnson and the staff at uh, the Mountaineering Equipment for doing this expo and uh, the good work they do in the store. I mean, you just, the customer service is beyond. And I and I, I, I started um, presenting for you maybe six or seven years ago, and it's just such a wonderful relationship. And I, and I really appreciate the way that you expose the outsides to people. You're passionate about engaging them and giving them good prices. And all the staff, every time in there, they know the, all the products and they'll spend time with you. Thank you for that. So, Wales is, Wales is surrounded by um, the ocean on three sides. And this is Wales right here. Um, it's surrounded on three sides by the sea, fiercely independent, cultur culturally rich with song, prose, storytelling, and its own Celtic language, Welsh. Wales is a mystical destination. The United Kingdom, which encompasses uh, Wales, Northern Ireland, Scotland, and England, make up the United Kingdom. And in 2012, Wales completed the Welsh coastal path that starts in the north in Chester and goes all the way around 870 miles, all the way down to Chepstow. And a lot of the trips that we do are on parts of it. On the, we, we do bits of it. I've never done the whole thing myself, but I'd like to one day, hopefully very soon. Now, I did a presentation next door at the U University of Minnesota about four years ago. And um, after I finished my presentation, smugly, a couple uh, came up to say to me, uh, I could see that they had something to tell me. And they were in their early 70s and they had just finished the, the, the walk 870 miles and um, some of it is some of it is very isolated around some of the uh, peninsulas here uh, there are bed and breakfast and pubs you can stay in and there's you know a lot of people actually will spend um, a week maybe they have a vacation for a week maybe two weeks uh, to do it and go back year after year until they finish it um, but it's it's and the, the thing about it is you're sometimes walking on the beach, the path sometimes go in, into the town. Um, sometimes you're up in the mountains, or well next to the ocean or the cliffs, but it goes all the way around. It's just and then this island of Anglesey that I'm going to be talking about quite a bit tonight uh, has you can actually cross over and walk all along around here. So I just have some facts about Wales I want to share with you. And that is Wales is 8,023 square miles. And that's about the size of Massachusetts. It's 170 miles from north to south. And it's about 60 miles from west to east. The population is just over 3 million. The Welsh language is spoken daily by 18 to 20% of the population for work school and business. We have our very own Welsh Parliament, Senedd Cymru, it's now called. Cymru is the Welsh word for Wales that compromises 60 members that oversee areas that include health, education, economic development, transport, the environment, agriculture, local government, and some taxes. Now, interesting enough, during COVID, now in Wales, we have control over our health, how our health is carried out. Um, we, we were in contradiction with the English and sometimes Wales was closed down and England wasn't. So it actually was very interesting to see that we had some control now over that. 
And it turned out that Wales was doing much better than England. And they actually, with, as far as the schools were concerned, they actually followed our example, which was nice for us in Wales. The, the nation of Wales and its formation can be traced back to the fourth and fifth century, following the end of the Roman rule in Britain. Julius Caesar first visited the islands in 56 BC and 55 BC with the inter intentions of returning. At that time, Rome was invested in the takeover of Gaul, which today is France and Belgium. Um, Rome was invested in the takeover of Gaul, which is modern day France. It was 90 years later that Rome invaded Britain. How the tribes of Britain had aided the Gauls trying to defend their lands. Of course, the Romans were looking for lands to grow their crops, for their huge armies and their precious metals. And for a Claudius in 43 AD sent over a huge contingent to invade the islands. Governor Paulinus and 20,000 Roman legionnaires annihilated the Druids who were governing the parliament of the Celts, the headquarters on the island of Mona in Anglesey in North Wales in 60 AD. The Romans conquered all of Europe, but did not set foot in Ireland. Probably the cause was Queen Ulrika, the big warrior of the Iseni tribe, who during the takeover of the Isle of Mona began an uprising against the Roman forces in the southeast of what is England today. Now, when the Romans came, they introduced Christianity to the islands when they first arrived and went about trying to convert the population to Christianity. The orders from Rome was to integrate Christianity with the Celts pagan practices. Not to kill them, but just that over the years they would get used to it. By 87 AD, the Roman control of the islands was mostly complete. In 300 AD, the Roman, uh, the Roman Empire was being tested at home and they started withdrawing with the final pullout in 410 AD. Now that was a huge vacuum. All of a sudden the Romans had gone, they left all these uh, fortifications behind. They still ruled. I mean, I mean, it was still Roman, you know, ruled and everything else. And people had got used to their way of doing things. But there was other forces that moved in. Some people, now this picture here is um, St. Govan's Head Peninsula in Pembrokeshire. The saints move in. Now who were the saints? The age of the saints was in the sixth century and those who promoted Christianity and spread the word were given the status of saints. Many of these guys came over from Ireland on small boats. The Welsh and Breton saints and missionaries took the course over to Ireland. Many of the Irish came over on small boats to the west coast of Wales, settled and picked up the Christian faith. Now, St. Govan was an Irish monk and hermit that crossed the Irish Sea to what is now Pembrokeshire. Here below the cliffs is where he made his home. Now, that shot I just show you with the peninsula there up above, the, the, the coastal path of Wales actually goes right there. And all you have to do is, is step down to this little gully here, and there's a little stairs there. Now, see, um, here below the cliffs is where he made his home and a place of worship in the sixth century. The small church there today was built in the 13th century. Next to the building are the two fresh water wells. Their waters bubbling up from the granite, which Gova needed to survive down there. So there's the church on the right hand side, you can see it. And it's, it's just an amazing place. And when you're down there, you can just come down from the from the um, from the um, coastal path and spend an hour or two down there and fill up your um, your drinking bottle with uh, fresh water. It's just amazing because at high tide, which comes almost up to the to the church, 
uh, it's covered, but if you're there low tide, you can fill up your bottles with fresh spring water. Now, St. Gobind died in 586 AD. So we have that information, but he spent, as far as we know, most of his life there. Now, Saxons, Vikings, and Normans started moving in in the middle of the fifth to the seventh century. The Anglo-Saxon tribes moved in from mainland Europe, after the exit of the Romans, they were a Germanic pagan people bent on displacing the indigenous Celtic Welsh. At the end of the 8th century, the Vikings moved in and began their attacks, followed by the Normans in the middle of the 11th century. Now the thing, the Isles have been fought over for thousands and thousands of years. The Welsh are the original settlers of the Isles and amazingly have been able to retain their rich Welsh language and culture. Now we're going to move on to some new developments in Wales in the last in the last year. Actually, this one, the first one is going to come from a place we very have heard about Stonehenge. Well, new evidence about Stonehenge from Cambridge University. Now these pictures are from um, the Royal Commission of Ancient of buildings in Wales, and they've been very kind to let us use them. Now, it's been determined that the blue rhyolite stones at Stonehenge came from Rossavellin Quarry here in Pembrokeshire, South Wales. This is where they started it off. It seems that Stonehenge stage one was built partly or wholly by a Neolithic migrants from Wales who brought their monuments of their ancestral identities to be recreated in similar form on Salisbury Plain, which is now Stonehenge. Stonehenge's first stage may also have served to unite the people of Southern Britain, Blue, uh, of Southern Britain. Blue stones were brought to the land of Saracen stones and, and instilled where the sky and the earth were envisioned in cosmic harmony and where people of different cultural and regional origins might gather for collective monumental gatherings and feasting. This, is, this, this information came from Parker Pearson from Cambridge University. Now, all the pictures you're gonna see now, from now on, uh, the images were produced by the Royal Commission of the Ancient and Historical Monuments of Wales. The text I'm reading to you was composed by Scott Lloyd. <clears throat> Bryn Cellidu. Now, Bryn Cellidu is a late Neolithic passage grave on the northeast of Anglesey, where the ancient Druids held their parliament. The passage tomb is one of the finest of its kind in Wales. In the north angle of the chamber is a 1.7 meter high smooth stone pillar, interpreted as a protector's or tomb guardian in the style of the Breton uh, style of tombs, or a phallic symbol. On one of the chamber stones bears a small spiral carving, which is probably Neolithic. There is a solar alignment on midsummer sunrise, a central pit contained the most richly decorated Neolithic carved stone in Wales. The original, original is in the National Museum of Wales with a cast on site. Bryn sits at the heart of a ritual landscape with a plough level cairn just to the south and a standing stone to the southwest. Now we're going to move on to the next one, which is Pentre Iven in Nevern, Pembrokeshire in South Wales. It's perhaps the finest surviving Neolithic tomb in Wales and forms one of a group of portal dolmens built around the tributaries of the Nevin Valley approximately 6,000 years ago. Its chamber is formed by a capstone of around 16 tons upheld on three uprights about 2.5 meters high. More recent research suggests the tomb was an indigenous creation by the local communities, but may have been nonetheless influenced by Irish culture and contact during a later stage of its use, when the long mound, long since eroded away, 
was extended. It is thought that the whole structure was covered in a massive mound or cairns of stones. Without access to the chamber permitted only through the door or portal at the south end, right there. Now we're gonna to move to the next one. <clears throat> Submerged forest in Ceredigion, mid Wales, just north of Aberystwyth. Now, this is very close to where I was brought up, actually. So I, I've, I've known the legends of the stories about this place, and uh, the, this new discovery have, have only been, you know, shown, the, shown itself in the past 10 years. The remains of a former Fenland forest landscape, usually only exposed in small areas at a time after winter storms have caused the covering of sand to be drawn offshore. The exposure comprised compacted peat and stumps and, and um, branches of trees. So that's up to 6,000 years old. I grew up in Wales and a few miles north of this site and my dear mother could tell us, would tell me the legends of what happened here very often before I went to sleep. Cantrer Gwilod is a legendary ancient sunken kingdom said to have occupied a tract of fertile land lying between Ramsey Island Ancient sunken kingdom said to have, uh, sorry, sunken kingdom said to have occupied a tract of foot line lying between Ramsey Island and Bardsey Island in what is now Cardigan Bay to the west of Wales. It has been described as a Welsh Atlantis and has featured in folklore, literature, and song. <clears throat> Two princesses of the realm held charge over the dike. One of these princes called Sathianin is described in one version as a notorious drunkard and carouser. And it was through his negligence that the sea swept through the open, open floodgates, ruining the land. We were told as children to listen carefully as the bells under the sea would hood, be heard from time to time. We were always listening. I can't remember hearing them though. <laughs> The next one is Castel Dinas Bran. The ruins of this medieval castle sit atop a prominent hill on the outskirts of San Gothen. The site originates with an Iron Age hill fort. Documentary evidence suggests the princes of Northern Powys built a timber castle here in the late 12th century, but it burned down without trace. It was probably Griffith Ap Maddox, son of the founder of the nearby Valley Cruces Abbey, who rebuilt the castle stone in 1270. But much like its predecessors, this third and last castle did not last very long. The next one we're gonna to come to is one of my favorite spots in Wales. And some of you watching tonight, I know you've been here, and we have some images from the top actually. And actually it's very close to the coastal path. The coastal path actually just goes right be, be underneath it. And the coastal path walks along the beaches around down here. So Tre Kairi in the village of San Hayarn on the Sien Peninsula. Few Welsh prehistoric pre 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 sites captured the imagination as powerfully as Tre Kairi's hill fort, which dominates the Sien Peninsula from the easternmost summit of the three peaks of, a, of the Eiffel, E-I-F-L. Now looking down from a scree-strewn summit at the height of 485 meters, this Tre Kyrie is one of the best preserved Iron Age forts, hill forts in Britain, where roundhouses, gateways, and ramparts can be seen in a remarkably intact condition. Now, Tre Kairi occupies a, steely, a steeply sloping site whose summit is occupied by substantial early Bronze Age burial cairn, cairn clearly preserved and respected within the later hill fort. Now, this is also this is a very special spot here in the town of Trausvenid in Mid Wales. It's a Roman. It was it was built by the Romans. Uh, in uh, in actually in um, AD 78, 
The fortification relies on the slope of an isolated spur northeast of Sin Lake Trausfanid, and you can see the lake right behind it, was constructed during North Wales campaigns of Go Governor Ganoas Julius, Julius Agricola in AD 78. It was occupied until it was abandoned around AD 140. In the 11th century, the Normans rescued part of the site for a moat. The site is important in Welsh mythology. It is the legendary palace of Ardidwy, near a castell, in the fourth branch of the ancient Mabinogi, the folk tales of Wales. And I know some of you watching tonight have actually been there. The next one is Small's Reef, and this was a very recent find. 20 miles out to sea, west of Pembrokeshire, in South Wales, there was a find of a sword hilt was made in one of the channels between the island isolated rocks to the south of the small lighthouse at a depth of less than 11 meters. There are large amounts of wrecks debris, debris from numerous 19th and 20th century wrecks wedged into the cracks and lying scattered around. Now in, 80, in August of 1991, a sports diver noted an object protruding from beneath scattered steel plating from a, a, a wooden wreck. The object proved to be a Viking sort hillguard with a silver wire and a yellow decoration of stylized animals interwoven with the snake-like beast. The quality of the decoration and materials you suggest 11th century dates for the sword and that once it belonged to an individual with high status such as a traveling chieftain. Now, next, we're going to go to Dinas Emrys. If you will, if you are going to Wales, this is one place I suggest you look out. It's, uh, it's an amazing spot, and it takes us back uh, to, uh, to Arthur. Dinas Emrys is a rocky and wooded hillock near Bath Gellert in Gwynedd, northwest Wales. Rising some 250 feet above the floor of the Glaslin River. And this is the pass that actually, if you're coming from the coast, there's, the, there's a road down there. And even the Roman garrison 2000 years ago, to, to actually get up to North Wales, they would have to go below this and climb um, just north of Snowdon up here. So this is a very important pass going back many, many years. Um, Little remains of the Iron Age hill fort or castle structures that once stood here. Save its stone ramparts and the house of a keep. Some believe the castle was erected by Llewellyn the Last to guard the road to the mountain passes of Snowdon. And that would have been in the 1200s, mid 1200s. The earliest elements date to the Iron Age, perhaps to the first or second century. A pool within the enclosure, thought to be an artificial construction, may date to this face. It is perhaps connected to the pool found in the popular tale of Vortiga, Arthur question mark, and the dragons. Other traces suggest habitation into the fifth century, which would put it in a time frame of Vortigern, and has long been known that there is a pool inside the fort. But when the archaeologist Dr. Savory ex excavated the hill fort between 1954 and 1956, he was surprised to find that not only were the fortifications up about the right time frame for either Vortigern or Ambrosius, which would have been Merlin, but that the theme, there was a platform above the pool as described in the Historia Britonium, a text written in the ninth century. So there's some really good um, connections here. Well, there's the historical uh, part. And now we're gonna go to some imagery now of um, some of the pl places we've gone in Wales. And it'll give you an idea of some other territory we're, we're gonna be hiking in. In Wales, there is so many different places to hike. As I mentioned, we have the coastal path, all 180 miles of it. 
um, and we can just go through the pictures. And of course, you've got, as I said, the, this, there's the little town of Abadaron there, where we actually, this group that, um, that's in this picture here, we stayed there for three nights and we traveled all around this area, getting to know the people on the area. And what else do we have? Yeah, so that's that's on the Thin Peninsula. And Abadaron been down here. And this, this is spectacular hiking around here. Now, I, I have not mentioned actually the fact is um, Snowdonia National Park, which is a lot of many of the pictures you're going to see, and it's right behind me right now, it's in the park. But this is the park right here in green. And then this is the Pembrokeshire Park, and these are all parks right here. And then there's another park here. Um, now, now this is this is the island of Bardsey, Bardsey Island. Now this this has got a lot of history here, and um, when the pilgrims, so we had the saints in the in the sixth century. So they established themselves, and then people came, and they would actually be, believe it or not, they would be walking along this same coastal path that you could be walking on, and uh, some some of these paths that you go on, they're actually they're so curved. They're still being trodden on. You can see that they've been going on for hundreds and hundreds of years. You're going to be walking in the same spot. Now, the, the, the place for a lot of the pilgrims in the 6th, 7th, 8th, 9th, 10th century was to go to this island right here. It's on the right on the tip of um, the Thin Peninsula, and it was the place that the saints would go to to uh, contemplate and be the last place to go before they passed on. And the story is there are 20,000 saints buried on this island. And a few years ago, well, no, this is more like 20 years ago, my, um, one of my family members used to go over there to work. To be, he was a volunteer over there. And he said, he said you could see the bones sticking out of the, of the, of the ground in some of the fields. Um, but anyway, there are some images in a minute we'll, we'll, of us being at the... Um, on the island. This is the Royal Ship Hotel in Dolgesai that we often stay in, a very nice spot at the southern, southern part of the Snowdoni National Park. This is one of the places we stayed in, not this last year, but the year before. And this was, this was actually, there were 11 of us all together. And every morning when we, after breakfast, our, our boots were ready for us. They were nice and warm so we could jump right into them and head out. And this is actually uh, just above the hamlet of Arthog, um, inland from Barmouth, um, that right on the um, estuary of the Maldach estuary. And uh, these uh, 10 ladies we had, um, they were actually on an eight day trip. And this is up above Arthog on the stream there. Now, our last night actually, I will talk about uh, you never know what's going to happen next. And that's what we like to do with our tours is, and if you go to Wales and you go into a pub one night and all of a sudden you see somebody and you say, oh, uh, there's, a, there's a choir here tonight. Well, this choir, not only were playing in the pub one night and they said for your last night, we will come and sing for you. And there was, this was in the hamlet of Cricketh, which is right on the shore of Cardigan Bay. And these wonderful men, they're, they're fishermen, they're bus drivers, they're postal workers, and they come down and it's their passion to sing, which is what people in Wales love to do. And this actually, that night, going back from the church, we actually couldn't get them to sing for us in the hotel because the hotel people thought maybe it'd be too loud for some of the residents staying there. So actually, the, they, uh, one of the choir members had a key to the church that was 400 yards away from our hotel. And this is actually, this is walking back at a full moon just down the road to go to a hotel, which was right on the ocean. So this is another group of people. And again, this is Bardsey Island. And this is in late September now. And you still have the flowers out, which is very nice. And this is this is this this bridge here crossing. Um, actually, this is on the way to um, Castell Emrys, where we just talked about um, Arthur. And this, this is an old, old bridge. It's probably been there for oh, hundreds of years at least. And again, this this was an impromptu. We were we were in the we were in the town of Dolgasai, which is a uh, um, an ancient town, and they had a choir 
um, gathering one night and we asked if we could go there to listen to them and they were all practicing. The beautiful thing about going to a practice versus to a concert is that you can actually, when they have a break, they'll come over because they'll want to know who you are and they'll want to talk with you. Now, this is very interesting. We were traveling in South Wales, in Pembrokeshire, in a um, national park down there. Oh, I'm going to say it was 2018. This was all covered over with sand the year before because we'd been there. This is St. Patrick's Church. Now, we, uh, St. Patrick was born in Wales. And um, they knew there was something going on here because, again, the wind and the sea were eroding the land. This is White Sand Beach down just west of St. David's in South Wales. They knew something was going on here, and they, um, I believe it's Sheffield University and David, David in Wales have been digging here, and they've discovered up to 100 bodies here. Patrick was born in Wales, a little bit inland from here. He had a church here between, uh, well, actually it was a burial ground from the claim from the 6th to the 11th century. And then a church was built, a little church. And where the people are uh, right here, I believe this was the church. And this is the burial ground that they've discovered up to 100 bodies. And I, I think I understand they were, the, the bodies were a lot of children and they were pointing from north to south rather than east to west. And then the next picture is, yeah, so that's right about right in here. And then the next picture, what was very interesting, these are local people that um, the, um, the, the, the research, uh, the, the, the people who are digging said, let's, let's get some of the local people uh, to join in. And these are just local people from St. David's uh, who decided that they would like to be part of it. And it just makes them, you know, they have something to do and be a part of this. Um, so, so anyway, so what happened to St. Patrick was he was born in Wales and he and his sister were taken by pirates and they were enslaved for many years. And then Patrick was able to get away, came back to Wales and supposedly he built a church here. And then he decided he wanted to go to Ireland to um, pass the Christian word because um, it was Irish pirates, I guess, that had, had, had enslaved him. So he wanted to go over there to pass the word. So that's, that's an interesting story. And this is, you know, there's more information on this every year when we go by. Now this is on Badsey Island, the island of, of the 20,000 saints. And this is a church that was built by um, Lord Newbury actually in, I believe, this island, you have to catch a ferry, uh, a local fisherman will come and get you. And this, it's a very remote area. And there were at one time up to 14 farms on the island. There's only one farm still exists. And um, it's, taken, it's been taken over by a society um, who take care of the island. But there's one farmer that takes care of things there. And the um, Lord Newbury, who owns a lot of property in Wales, had, had said to the people, I can either give you, I'll build you a church or I'll build you a pier. And people decided on a church. And I believe this church was built in the 1940s, I think. And it's a nice little church. And, um, and my Thomas Evans here, who's a fabulous um, triple harp, harpist and singer and storyteller. If you go to Wales, go and look for her. If you come with us, you'll certainly get, a, um, you get her to um, present to you. And anyway, she happened to be on the island during a poet retreat. And we were supposed to meet at the end of the week and she emailed me and said, sorry, I can't meet with you. And I said, well, we're going to Bazzi Island. So she actually sang with us and she played a harp. It was wonderful. So this is actually a group of people in 1978, no, 19, what are we now? 2017, 2018. And this is from a that that INH fought right on top. And again, the coastal path is right below here. And that was a lunch. We stopped for lunch and the weather we had actually, this is in, I think it was late September, early October, and we had nothing but sunshine. Now this is one of my favorite um, mountains in the whole world. And this is the iconic massive Kader Idris. And this is um, just, just to the east of Dol Gethai. Um, 
And right behind, right behind here is the um, Cardigan Bay. And on a, on, a, on a clear day, you can see for miles and miles and miles. And you can see there's no trees. You know, the visibility is beautiful. And um, it, it is such a beautiful hike up here. It really is. And all these, now this is a picture from the top of Snowden. This is actually on the way up to Snowden. And um, again, it's on a fairly clear day. And this is, um, this is the Irish Sea over here. And this is a group from the Cadre Drift we just saw. This is a group of um, guests that we made it to the top. It was a little bit, they wanted to get to the top and it was uh, a little bit rainy and overcast. And we actually got to the top and it cleared up. And um, this is on our way down. And this is actually hiking up Snowden. Um, and as you can see, it's just a beautiful hike. Um, and Snowden is about 3,600 3, feet up and there's a restaurant on top. So when you get to the top, it's well worth it. Uh, this is actually the top of Snowden right here. And this is, uh, this is actually was taken from my second favorite mountain in Wales, which is the Knicht, C-N-I-C-H-T. And these are cotton, these are cotton, um, cotton grass that you see blowing in the wind. So this is the mountain of Knicht, which is, which is a mountain that not many people go to. And well, I'll talk about it again in a minute, but the fact is we, we try not to go to too many places where there's too many people. Depends on the day, if it's on the weekend, for instance, you'll try and avoid the crowds. And this, this is a really nice, sweet spot to go uh, uh, during the weekends. Uh, this, this is a lake I had never been to until about, oh, maybe two years ago. And one of our guides have, she told me about this lake and it's actually named after my name, Howell, H-Y-W-E-L. And, and, and I'd always wanted to go and see it. And she knew exactly where it was. And it's quite remote. And um, I was able to get up there and we spent a good day up there hiking around and we didn't see anybody. Uh, and this, um, this have down there, and this is, this is actually a stone, a granite stone wall. Why? It's about eight, 70 feet high. Well, it's to make sure the sheep from this side don't go over to this side. And yes, it must have been quite a struggle to put it in, but you can see them for miles and miles. Now this is um, a bridge, this bridge is from the 11th century and it crosses over, it's an old um, drover's road that I actually did this trip two years ago. And I did it on a, it was kind of a foggy day when I was up there. And uh, it is, it goes from right about the coast at Dufferin right here, down to the market town of Dolgetlein. So basically what happened was cattle drovers, uh, 8th, 9th, 10th century onwards, would take their cattle from Wales and they would take them down to possibly uh, London, which would possibly take about 20 to 30 days. They would take them up there and um, take them down there rather, and they would, uh, would get, they would get a much better price. And some of the roads, these, can I have the next one? So this is the, this is the bridge that it was, a, this is a drover's bridge. And now, if you saw the last picture, you could see the tractors of, of modern day cannot actually get across this bridge. So they have to go through the creek. And, um, but this is uh, for people to walk on now. And actually I spent the day going up, up the path all around. It was, it was a 12, 14 mile hike. And I got into the fog and I was able to find my way down on the other side. These are bluebells that come out in May, beautiful underneath the groves of tree, you'll find them everywhere. And these are mostly oak trees. There's a, there's a nice mushroom there that uh, the fairies love to sit under. And this, this is an ancient um, um, oak grove um, that they're stunted. And the reason they're stunted is because it's granite underneath. But a lot of the shipbuilding, they needed these oaks for, for different shapes for the, um, for, for the building the ships. And this, this is the, if, if I got out of the way, the Knecht is right behind me. Or is, is, 
And right here behind me, I don't know if you can see me here, but anyway, this is the Knecht Mountain I talked about. And this is it right here again. Now you wonder, what the hell is this? Well, this is a fence. Now, why are they making it out of stone? Well, this is from the quarries and this is what's left behind. This, is, this wasn't good enough to build a slate uh, for the roofs. So they, they, they threw it away and somebody had the brilliant idea to make a fence out of it. And this is a couple that came with us to Wales. This is the falls in Arthur. And this was their um, anniversary. The, I think it was their 20th anniversary. And this is actually a Castell Embrus, where um, this is um, King Arthur's spot there that we talked about earlier on. It was a Roman fortification. And again, there is Snowden right there. And this is uh, the village of Beth Gellert. It's one of our favorite places to stay. Um, while well, we're in the area uh, around Snowden. Oh, food. What's the food like in Wales? Well, it's actually really good. And this is the pa a seafood paella we had uh, in Dogesai, which was a very well-known restaurant and it was absolutely stunning food. And this is a couple from, actually they're not from Wisconsin, but they're, they're from Minnesota today. But anyway, they joined us on one of the tours. And this, again, this is on the coastal path. And that was in beginning of October. And this is a hawthorn bush in the spring. And again, that's an old ancient crossover and people and sheep cross over it all the time beneath this rill. Yeah, this is on the coastal path. Actually, this is waiting for us to go over to the Bardsey Island on the ferry uh, with this group of people. And this is in Pembrokeshire where St. Govan's, very close to where St. Govan's, uh, I showed you earlier on with the, the, the saint. This is in the spring and this is the flower thrift. May is a great time for the, for the flowers and the birds, the pelicans, um, not the pelicans, the puffins come back in the month of um, April. And they stay until about August and then they go back to the south. And again, this is a group on top of Trekairi. And this actually, this, we do stop from time to time to have lunch and tea especially. And this is um, this is uh, one of our favorite places for a cup of tea. And this this building has been there since the 14th century. Um, and this is the river um, Conway um, at um, San Roost. Beautiful spot. Mm -mm. Now these here are Welsh cakes, and if you do go to Wales, don't miss them. They're 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 always around there. Sometimes you find them in pubs and cafes and everywhere. And these are, are <clears throat> excuse me, flapjacks. Don't miss them. They're really, really good. Nothing like the flapjacks we have. And not last year, the year before, we had an amazing crop of blackberries. And oftentimes during a hike, somebody will bring a container with us and we'd fill a couple of yogurt containers or something. And we'd have these with our ice cream at night. Okay, so this picture is, um, the one on the left is called uh, um, the Giant. And yes, it's in the Rhinogrid Mountains in central Wales. And again, have my one of, one of our guides introduced me to him a few years ago. And uh, it's, just, it's just so beautiful. It was actually nice to have a little bit of fog behind it because you can see the lips. And Now this, this fellow over here is in the Chiricahua Mountains in Arizona. And it's actually about, as the crow flies, about 5,025 miles away from this guy. And they're actually pointing at each other. And I can't wonder if they're actually related. I don't know. <laughs> but anyway, that's uh, the Slate Trail. Okay, my, my buddy, uh, Gareth Roberts, Gareth Lloyd Roberts in Sanberries, he has been working on the Snowdonia Slate Trail for the past four years. And it's right in the middle of the Snowdonia National Park they have created this um, 85 mile long circular trail, which enables walkers to explore the industrial heritage of the Slate Valleys. Walkers will experience some of the hidden areas of Snowdonia along with forgotten ruins of the Slate industry, its culture and heritage. 
It's not just about the slate industry that began in earnest in the 18th century, the trail visit to steam railways, less frequented parts of Snowdonia National Park. It also passes through all the major mountain ranges, forests, lakes, and rivers from the mountains to the sea. The, the trail is considered to be very challenging and it's 85 miles. Now, I just wanted to talk a little bit about the logistics of going to Wales. Well, let's start with right now. It's, it's a little bit of a challenge right now because it's the COVID. We've decided to cancel all our trips for this year because we're doing a lot better over here in the States, but over in Wales, it's still, you know, you have to transit through maybe possibly Iceland, Ireland, England. It's just, you have, we have to get everything right before we can get there. Not only do we have to get there, we have to get back. And all our people in Wales have told us, wait a bit, this is so we've canceled everything until next year. So May of next year, we're gonna start up all over again. So logistics about getting to Wales. Do we have a map here? No, we, we didn't. Okay, so, okay, so, so what we can do is, so you can fly from the United States to, um, to Manchester in England. That's one way of doing it. That's a straight flight, usually from Chicago, Boston or Seattle or whatever. And then you can catch a train down to um, to uh, to where we can meet up with you. Whether whether that's in um, most of the time it's in Bangor, Wales, which is on the coast. Shall we get? A, do we have a picture? Here? Don't worry about it. Don't, okay. don't worry about it. Okay. So any, anyway, so so there is a um, a train you can take. There's there's a train about every hour from Manchester Airport to Bangor in Wales, where we usually meet. But anyway, so you, you can fly to Manchester if you want to go to Snowdonia. Now, if you want to go to, um, you can fly to London and catch a train from London up to Bangor, and that's about three hours. Now, an interesting way of doing it is, is to fly to Dublin. Spend a night or two in Dublin uh, with the Irish, because they're very friendly also and then take the ferry over to um, over to uh, Holyhead in Wales. And that's about two and a half hours. So you could fly to Dublin, spend a night or two, catch the ferry to Wales, and then we can pick you up there. Or you can, if you're by yourself, you can just start from there and um, rent a car or whatever you want to do. And then you could, um, you can, you can go there. Um, so there's different ways of getting there. Now, what else do I want to tell you about? The time of year to visit. So visiting Wales, uh, we, uh, we like to go in the spring or the fall. It's, it's, it's less people. It's, um, it's not so crowded. It's probably, less, it's more, uh, it's cheaper. And uh, you, have to, you just have more time by yourself, not, not so many crowds. Um, now, September, October. Now, in my opinion, October is getting better all the time. We've actually run our trips into mid-October and the weather, now and again, you'll get a rainy day, but uh, October is not a bad month to be traveling over there. Um, accommodation and food in Wales. Uh, seafood, or seafood, lamb, microbreweries, gin, gin uh, distilleries, Penderin Welsh whiskey. Now I know some of you, a couple of guests listening tonight, are, um, are participating uh, in with some Penderin Welsh whiskey that some of you really enjoyed on the trip. And uh, we, it's, it's a Welsh whiskey, it's called Penderin, P-E-N-D-R-Y-N, -E and yes, you can buy it in the States. And it's a, um, it's a very wonderful um, Welsh whiskey. So, so, before I leave you for questions, uh, I want to talk about global tourism. So global tourism accounts for 8% of global greenhouse gases emissions, as well as other significant environmental and social impacts that are not always beneficial to local communities and their economics. For this reason, many tourist development organizations are beginning to focus on sustainable tourism in order 
to mitigate negative effects caused by the growing impact of tourism. Sustainable friendly tourism is an option for today for us to travel. What does that mean exactly? Well, travelers are beginning to become more selective in making their choices. When traveling today, some things to consider are, does the money we spend benefit the local economy? Can we travel in an off peak time and visit places that are not hotspots and avoid overcrowding? Now travelers can educate ourselves beforehand about the country and its people. We can travel by train or bus when possible. We can slow down. We can stay longer to get to know the community and make some new friends. We can hire local people as guides and eat and stay at local businesses. When we engage with the local people, rather than whizzing past, we are allowing the locals to get to know us and our community back home. I have to share these two pictures because something remarkable happened here. So there were 10 of us, we've been hiking all day, we were tired and we decided we we're gonna go out to this pub in the Thin Peninsula for something to eat. When, it, when we, well, actually call, we called and they said, well, we have room, we'll make room for you. And the only way they could make it is to actually build three, three, three tables in the middle of the pub. And all around us were these people sitting, eating. I have to say it was in early October, they were kind of looking at each other and all of a sudden these 11 Americans turn up and they're, they're all looking at us and thinking, oh boy, it's gonna get loud in here all of a sudden. So I went up to the bar and I got myself a pint and I ran into this young man here who's actually walking the cliff, the, the coastal path by himself um, in, in aid of, um, of uh, um, fundraising. And he came up to me and he said, oh, nice shoes you have on, nice climbing boots. And I said, yes, he was breaking the ice. And he said, where are you from? I said, well, we have a group here from the States. And basically he ran and he said, well, I have an aunt that lives in Reno, Nevada. The next thing you know is he came over. We're having so much fun with him. Everybody else around the room, there must have been eight or 10 people, joined the conversation. Everybody was talking together. Everybody was laughing. And we all ended up together at the end of the night. It was a wonderful experience. It's just sharing rather than just being there um, with ourselves. It was a wonderful experience. So this is Hab. Oh, no, no, this is... Um, Two of our, this is two of our guides, Ellen and Gareth. And this is uh, a storyteller that we have. And this is Meyer Thomas Evans, the harpist that sang for, let's see, that's outside the church on Badsley Island that she, um, she sang for us. Okay, so this picture, so this picture, okay. When we engage with the local people, rather than whizzing past, we are allowing the locals to get to know us and our community back home. Most of us are passionate when we travel abroad and engaging as a traveler with curiosity, rather than as a tourist firing off questions, can be a different experience. Perhaps you have met some Irish folks, English people, and maybe a few Scots along the way. Cross over the border to Wales and meet the Welsh over a cup of tea you will like them. They are friendly, they're a friendly lot and they're looking forward to meet you. Now, before I just finish, I just have to tell you the story about this lady from British Columbia. She's, she's the, actually the oldest person that's been, ever been on our walkabouts. She was 80 years of age. She did extremely well, but she said at the beginning of the trip, before I go back, I have to have a high tea. And we chose this wonderful place just outside of Aberystwyth. And she was the biggest smile of the whole trip. Wild Wales tours and walkabouts. We've canceled them all for this year, but next year we'll be starting them again in May of 2002. Thank you to all your viewers. And all our walkabouts are on www.wildwalestours.com. Thank you so much. And I'd love to answer some questions if you have some questions. Hi there, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. All right, uh, we had a question earlier and you kind of touched on it, but I uh, wondering if you could elaborate more on, uh, someone was wondering what the weather was like in October. 
Well, actually, I did touch on it. And I, for some reason, it seems to be getting better. Um, I would say sep the end of September is it's usually excellent. And that, uh, that now reaches, I would say, into the 10th, in the last few years, into the 10th and 12th and the 14th of October. I mean, even November sometimes at the, in the first week of November, but that's pushing it a little bit. So yeah. I would, end of September and October, the first 10 days at least in October are, are, are really good. Oh, nice. That's excellent. Yeah. I noticed in um, a lot of the photos, you know, people are wearing uh, rain jackets. And I know from working in the store and having been an outdoors person a long time that even though you have a rain jacket on, doesn't necessarily mean it's raining all the time. It's just a wind. It's a windbreaker, you know. And uh, uh, I'd, like to, I'd like to add to that. And the yeah. fact is, in Wales, it doesn't rain uh, in in units of days. It might it may rain for five minutes. It might rain for oh, sure. thirty minutes or two hours. But you always have to put it in your bag. You put it in your bag, and you you know if you need it. You put it on and you take it off. So it's it's um it the 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 fr the front the weather fronts in Wales move through. The, our weather factory is Greenland, so they're coming down uh, one after another. So all of a sudden sure. it's rain for half an hour, the sun comes out, and then maybe <laughs> it's it's quite different than we're used to. So a light rain jacket is always good to have in your bag. Awesome, yeah, that's great. Um, Looks like I'm not sure who this is, but they say thank thank you, Taff. So lovely to see these beautiful pictures of your country and of our trip together. That's a very nice message Wonderful. there. Well, thank you so much for what you do for uh, uh, the people who want to enjoy the outside. I really appreciate it. And say hello to Rod and, and the crew. And uh, I appreciate we appreciate it very much. Yeah, likewise. We we can't do these without you. So I really appreciate your your time and effort and your knowledge and your experience and. Uh, I just want to remind viewers that uh, if you missed or joining late, you you can um, catch up on this presentation and any other ones. They'll be on our YouTube channel. Uh, they're being archived and posted within about 24 to 48 hours. So you can go back and watch them at any time of the day you want. Um, let us know if you have any questions. Um, Wild Wills Tours and Taco Balls. I just want to thank Taft directly. Thank you so much. And I don't see any more questions coming in. So we'll just go ahead and sign off. Does that work? sound good? Thank you so much. It's November at the Expo. All right. Sounds good. Looking forward to it. Cheers. Thanks a lot. Bye.